Section 29 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 29. Selected Poems by Alcius Alcius, 6th century B.C. Alcius, a contemporary of the more famous poet whom he addressed as Violet-crowned, pure, sweetly smiling Sappho, was a native of Mytilene in Lesbos. His period of work fell probably between 610 and 580 B.C., at this time, his native town was disturbed by an unceasing contention for power between the aristocracy and the people, and Alcius, through the vehemence of his zeal and his ambition, was among the leaders of the warring faction. By the accidents of birth and education, he was an aristocrat, and in politics he was what is now called a high Tory. With his brothers, Sisus and Antimididus, two influential young nobles as arrogant and haughty as himself, he resented and opposed the slightest concession to democracy. He was a stout soldier, but he threw away his arms at Ligatum when he saw that his side was beaten, and afterward wrote a poem on this performance, apparently not in the least mortified by the recollection. Horace speaks of the matter, and laughingly confesses his own like misadventure. When the kindly Pittacus was chosen dictator, he was compelled to banish the swashbuckling brothers for their abuse of him. But when Alcaeus chanced to be taken prisoner, Pittacus set him free, remarking that forgiveness is better than revenge. The irreconcilable poet spent his exile in Egypt, and there he may have seen the Greek oligarch who lent his sword to Nebuchadnezzar, and whom he greeted in a poem, a surviving fragment of which is thus paraphrased by John Addington Simmons. From the ends of the earth thou art come, back to thy home, the ivory hilt of thy blade, with gold is embossed and inlaid, since for Babylon's host a great deed thou didst work in their need, slaying a warrior, an athlete of might, a royal, whose height lacked of five cubits one span, a terrible man. Alcaeus is reputed to have been in love with Sappho, the glorious, but only a line or two survives to confirm the tale. Most of his lyrics, like those of his fellow poets, seem to have been drinking songs, combined, says Simmons, with reflections upon life and appropriate descriptions of the different seasons. No time was amiss for drinking, to his mind. The heat of summer, the cold of winter, the blazing dog-star and the driving tempest, twilight with its cheerful gleam of lamps, midday with its sunshine, all suggest reasons for indulging in the cup. Not that we are justified in fancying Alcius, a mere vulgar toper, he retained Aeolian sumptuousness in his pleasures, and raised the art of drinking to an aesthetic attitude. Alcius composed in the Aeolic dialect, for this reason, it is said, that it was more familiar to his hearers. After his death, his poems were collected and divided into ten books. Burke has included the fragments, and one of his compositions has come down to us entire, his Pote Lyrici Grazi. His love of political strife and military glory led him to the composition of a class of poems which the ancients called Stasiotica, Songs of Sedition. To this class belong his descriptions of the furnishings of his palace, and many of the fragments preserved to us. Besides those martial poems, he composed hymns to the gods, and love and convivial songs. 
His verses are subjective and impassioned. They are outbursts of the poet's own feeling, his own peculiar expression toward the world in which he lived, and it is this quality that gave them their strength and their celebrity. His meters were lively, and the care which he expended upon his strophes has led to the naming of one meter the Alcaic. Horace testifies, Odes two, thirteen, two, twenty-six, etc., to the power of his master. The first selection following is a fragment of his Stasiotica. It is a description of the splendor of his palace before the work of war began. THE PALACE From roof to roof the spacious palace halls glitter with war's array. With burnished metal clad the lofty walls beam like the bright noonday. There white-plumed helmets hang from many a nail, above in threatening row steel garnished tunics and broad coats of mail spread o'er the space below chalcedian blades enow and belts are here graves and emblazoned shields well-tried protectors from the hostile spear on other battlefields with these good helps our work of war is begun with these our victory must be won translation of colonel muir a banquet song the rain of zeus descends and from high heaven a storm is driven and on the running water brooks the cold lays icy hold then up beat down the winter make the fire blaze high and higher mix wine as sweet as honey of the bee abundantly then drink with comfortable wool around your temples bound we must not yield our hearts to woe or wear with wasting care for grief will profit us no wit, my friend, nor nothing mend. But this is our best medicine, with wine fraught, to cast out thought. Translation of J. A. Simmons An Invitation Why wait we for the torch's lights? Now let us drink while day invites. In mighty flacons hither bring the deep red blood of many a vine that we may largely quaff and sing the praises of the god of wine, the son of Jove and Semele, who gave the jocund grape to be, a sweet oblivion to our woes. Fill, fill the goblet, one and two, let every brimmer as it flows, in sportive chase the last pursue. Translation of Sir William Jones The Storm now here, now there, the wild waves sweep, whilst we betwixt them o'er the deep, in shattered tempest-beaten bark, with laboring ropes are onward driven, the billows dashing o'er our dark, upheaved deck and tatters riven, our sails, whose yawning rents between, the raging sea and sky are seen. Loose from their hold our anchors burst, and then the third, the fatal wave, comes rolling onward like the first, and doubles all our toil to save. Translation of Sir William Jones The Poor Fisherman The fisher Diotimus had, at sea, and shore the same abode of poverty, his trusty boat, and when his days were spent, therein self rowed to ruthless dis he went, for that which did through life his woes beguile, supplied the old man with a funeral pile. Translation of Sir William Jones The State What constitutes a state? Not high-raised battlement or labored mound, thick wall or moated gate, not cities fair with spires and turrets crowned. No, men, high-minded men, with powers as far above dull brutes endued, in forest break or den, as beasts excel cold rocks and brambles rude. Men who their duties know, but know their rights and knowing dare maintain, prevent the long aim blow, and crush the tyrant while they rend the chain. Translation of Sir William Jones 
poverty. The worst of ills, and hardest to endure, past hope, past cure, in penury who, with her sister-mate, disorder, soon brings down the loftiest state, and makes it desolate. This truth the sage of Sparta told, Aristodemus old. Wealth makes the man, on him that's poor, proud worth looks down, and honor shuts the door. Translation of Sir William Jones End of Section 29